Okay, everybody's got a fucking podcast. I mean, we have a podcast, so obviously anyone can do it. Wait, this is a podcast? Are you recording right now? Technical difficulties. No, you don't have to say anything. I'm going to edit it out. Technical difficulties. <laughs> okay. I put mayonnaise on a pickle. Yo, I know y'all ain't playing ski ball. I'm trying to go to bed. <laughs> do I see? I mean, my feet stink, right? Yeah. Test, test. Alright. So. We're back. We're Jason. back. Hello. Again. It's good to be back. Yeah. Good to be back. Uh, today, we're going to cover the five movies and shows that if we were being uh, uh, th- tossed to a desert island, damned to a desert island, deserted island. Desert island. I don't know. You can get an island that's also if, a if it's a deserted island. I feel like yeah. it's more. It's less likely we'd be able to watch any of these because yes, yes. there's no infrastructure set up for electricity. If the desert island, for whatever reason, you have a TV, <laughs> a DVD player, a generator. If we abandon all logic and all these things just work, yes. and we can watch movies and TV shows. Here's the, here's the easier way to say it. Uh, you're only allowed to watch five movies and five shows for the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. What are they? About islands. So, number one, Gilligan's Island. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did you think we were doing a different thing? I was under the completely different <laughs> perspective. I might need to rewrite some of my notes. <laughs> if you don't give me a couple days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just do some Google searches real quick. Movies about islands. <laughs> Uh, no, no. Uh, ba- yeah, basically. So, more or less, it's our five favorite movies in a way, but also, there's the part of, like, Star Wars isn't in my, a Star Wars movie isn't in my top five, but the fact that if it's all I can watch. Yeah, your rewatchability list, kind Yeah, it, yeah kind of rewatchability is definitely the one I what, picked, the one I picked, and also... The fact of, like, I know I'll miss Star Wars if I can only watch a handful of stuff. Sure. So I, I, I was like, well, I, I want a piece of Star Wars if, you know, if we got to do this. But, so that's what we'll be covering. But uh, to start out, I just want to talk about the rest of this series that we're kind of doing. So, so far we got, we, we went through the highest grossing movies ever. Uh, the top 50, and that is an audio only, because I messed up and didn't plug one of the phones in to film this, and it died, so if you're on YouTube going, I'd like to watch that program, sorry. You'll have to listen instead. You'll just have to listen to the audio, we're available pretty much anywhere you get podcasts, and if we're not, you know, shoot me an email at contentcrisishotlineyahoo.com, you don't have to do that if you don't want to. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll get on top of that, but I'm pretty sure we're available in most places. And then we did one kind of talking about the highest grossing of the sixties and that one will be labeled highest grossing of the sixties. I was just having this kind of panic moment in the middle of the week, feeling like a hack going like I didn't do a lot of research as far as just sixties movies in general. But the point of that one was to kind of go back and say, these are the highest grossing of the 60s, because the point of the highest grossing one was to say, highest grossing does not necessarily make a must-watch a must watch movie, yeah. or a good movie, by by that that logic also. Looking at you, Casablanca. <laughs> <laughs> uh, looking at the Minion movies. <laughs> that kind of thing, so... Just wanted to put that out there, you know, about the 60s one that'll be up already at this time. Uh, so if you watched it and said we were hacks, you could also email in to contentcrisishotlineyahoo.com and tell us what hacks we are. <laughs> uh, or you're just silently at home mad and I'm addressing it now and saying, hopefully you don't think of it that way. We're just literally going through the highest grossing and expressing quite a bit of apathy for Casablanca. <laughs> Are we really wrong for that one? I don't think so. 
I just wanted to just I just want to give the full thing. Sure. I'm always uh, I'm always over worried about what people are thinking and people's feelings and whatnot. That's probably a thing I should get over. But anyhow, so we'll move on to uh, top five movies about islands. Or no, sorry, the other thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, you want to start or you want me to start? I uh, You can start off. I think we'll alternate. We'll just go. I'll say a movie. You'll say a movie. We'll make sure neither then... of us rambles on too long. Exactly. Sounds good. Mine will be pretty short, my first one, because uh, Pulp Fiction is my favorite movie ever. So I have to take it with me. Sure. So that's pretty much my whole spiel. I like Pulp Fiction. It's about fun stuff. Go ahead. Great. So I'll pretend that uh, the first one on my list was not also Pulp Fiction. No, that's <laughs> fine. And then we'll just move right to number two. Right <laughs> Do you want to talk about why Pulp Fiction yeah, is let's great? Talk about I, I feel like that's, that's, that's a good point Absolutely. to take here. Yeah, we can go through that. Uh, so my thing with Pulp Fiction is the first time I watched it, um, it was the first time I watched a movie that told the story like that. Where you're not really... Until the end of the movie, really, you, you, you have to do some independent work in your head when sure. that movie's over to figure out what the actual order of events is. Yeah, there's definitely a timeline that you're stitching events to as it goes through its different sequences. Yeah. And so... That's a unique part of it. And so, in my mind, you stay completely engaged with it the whole time because... You're just going, what the hell's going on here? And also, I love, like, uh, gangster, like, crime-type movies. And so, that's obviously a point that appeals to me. And there's a Tarantino interview where he's talking about what Pulp Fiction is. And he's saying it's it's three of the big events that, like, movies have, right? It's the big fight scene. It's, um, you know... The, the employee taking the boss's wife out, you know, which I'm like, I'm not as, not as familiar with that trope, mm-hmm. but like Quentin Tarantino knows way more about movies than I do. And so I'm not going to yeah. sit here and argue well, with it's, that. Well, it's almost a trope of being like in that, like a, uh, like, I know I can't do anything with this woman, but I kind of want to do something with this woman. Yes. And they almost kind of play on that with the fact that, uh. Uh, someone else had done that and, you know, was supposedly thrown off of a roof for it. Yes. Uh, even though they later go back and be like, well, that's between them. I don't think anybody knows why he was thrown off that roof besides uh, the two of them. Yes. But I thought that was kind of a fun little play in there is even him recognizing that trope and kind of making fun of it within it. Right. And then the, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was just the trope of like, oh, we gotta go retrieve this thing for the boss. Fight. Yeah, it's Wells. And it's Vincent Jules. Yeah, yeah, that's that's it. Yeah, I believe just retrieving that thing and you know what the thing is. And uh, it's been a while since I watched that interview, so I might might have got a little bit of it wrong. Sure. So excuse me if I did. Um, but somehow all that just ties into one entertaining fucking movie, and a lot of these are. And almost all of Tarantino's movies have their humor tied into them. It's a funny movie. It's about cool shit. And it's it's very fucking unique. And those are pretty much, I would say, why I like it. Yeah. So. And, and definitely, as, as far as, like, a first time watching, um, uh, there, there was no way to really, like, figure out, I guess, like, how the story was going to evolve. Because every scene building into the next was so... I guess, like, uniquely made. That, like, it, it didn't seem like it followed, like, what you would expect a movie to follow the line of, you know? And, uh... Just the, the, the dialogue in general. Just the way, like, the, the characters communicate between each other. Like, how much time they spent talking about, uh... You know, like, what a, a cheeseburger was called in France or whatever. Yes. Like, just, just the dialogue in general. It's just so interesting. And, and that that's just something that I always, like... I, I love going back to it and just listening to them talk because... I would love to hear all the conversations that some of these characters have had because they just, it's just such an interesting way to talk and it's not how people talk. 
Right. And I think that's been a thing that's been brought up in like other things about Pulp Fiction is no one actually has dialogue or talk like that, but it right. still somehow builds out these characters in really interesting ways, and you can kind of get, uh, I guess, a much better feel for them just with the way that they communicate to each other and to the other characters in the story. So yeah. cool. I love Pulp Fiction. Yes. <laughs> just finally got uh, my wife to watch it, so I was really excited. Well, so we had watched it first when we had first started dating, and uh, she paid no attention to it because she was just really nervous that we were together watching a movie. Uh-huh. Uh, and then I finally got her to watch it uh, again, and she liked it a lot more the second time around. But That's good. I always get super excited when I can watch Pulp Fiction with somebody and be way more excited than them <laughs> to watch it. Yeah. My wife hates it, which is somewhat of a bummer. <laughs> uh. Well, if you ever feel like watching it again, you just call me. On a desert island. <laughs> yes. Uh, Alright, so let's go to number two. Mine was uh, Airplane. My reason for this is I, I figured if I'm only allowed a certain amount of things, I gotta watch a comedy of some kind. Yeah. And a lot a lot of stuff with like if you think about like your classic like raunchy comedies like, I don't know, a lot the thing that I love about Airplane so much is just the simple fact that Everything is fucking ridiculous. Yeah. Nothing is, like, really, like, a sensible or, like, a toned-down version of what they're trying to convey. Yeah. Everything is turned up to 11, and they're aware of it. It's a hundred... I have a drinking problem. <laughs> Spot yourself in the face, you know? Don't call me Shirley. Beating that woman up that is yeah. <laughs> sick. Like, or, free, or panicking, excuse me. And, uh... Sweat but dripping down to his face. Yeah. Just the whole thing, it, it, all it, smoking or non-smoking, and then the ticket's smoking. Yeah. You know, it's literally got smoke rolling off of it. Like, shit like that. 100% ridiculous, and, you know, I, I, a lot of comedy movies, just with, they gotta have the, you know, the, there still has to be the element of, like, some kind of actual conflict where it's just ridiculous that yeah. some plane is being landed by this guy that can't put water in his mouth and <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's like fun. every small component of this movie is based off of like a pun or a joke or some ridiculous aspect yeah and it just it, it works out because it, it sets that expectation i guess from the beginning and then you're just waiting for the next ridiculous antic to start and yeah uh yeah so i figure i gotta take a comedy and that's the one i want to take because it always makes me laugh i don't really get sick of airplane sure so all right, very good. So next on my list, I had uh, Lord of the Rings. Uh, Lord of the Rings is a huge series for me. Um, so if I have to pick one out, I'll, I'll go with Return of the King. You know, I'd like to take them all, but I'm trying to, to spare myself a little bit there. So yeah. we'll, we'll do Return of the King, extended edition, obviously. Sure. Um, but Lord, Lord of the Rings is just something like I've I've always loved. Like it's it's I read the book series once, which was plenty, uh, and I listen to the audiobooks every now and then. I watch the movies a lot. And that's just something I can always go back to. It's just such an interesting world. I love the characters. I love the actors. I love watching the special features of it. I love watching the interviews. Yeah. Um, that's just absolutely a world that I, I've fallen in love with over the years. And, uh, yeah, I, I could watch that all day, every day, no problems. That's very... I, you know, recently I've gotten really into special features of just whatever it is I'm watching. That's always why I've liked having the DVD yeah. as opposed to, like, is when people call me crazy for having my collection here, and, you know, I just go like, well, I mean, there's so much, like, the extra, and so if you give a shit about any of that, that's why I like having that stuff. Yeah. And some DVDs just kind of cheap out, and they're just like, play movie, scene selection, languages, and you go like, oh, why, why did I bother buying this? Right. But... When they do, like, the interviews or when they go through... And, you know, one of the things I love is, um, uh, I guess, kind of like the like the 3D and, like, animation technology that gets involved with some of those scenes. Like, obviously, not all that is, like, a practical effect. Some of that is just, like, computer-generated imaging and stuff like that. And that's something specifically I always found super interesting. So I love to see it in kind of, like, those, like, uh, I guess, like, fantasy types of movies and some of, like, the, you know, big monster movies. They usually have special features evol- involving... You know, kind of how they created it, how they handled, like, the scale of things, and, yeah. uh, like, uh, things like that. Just super interesting to me, and that's that's one thing I'll, I'm very thankful for special features for. That That's 
like Charles and I going through Star Wars right now. Yeah. Watching the I for kind of forgot to do it with one, two, and three. And well, I just I guess I just didn't think of going through the special features of one, two, and three. And just the fact that four, five, and six are so old. I was curious of like how shit got shot, and so I watched the special features on four and five so far, mm. and just all, all the stuff with you know it's the miniature models of uh, you know pretty much these towns or like however they're shooting shit. And, yeah, you know like on in five when they're on Hoth and the uh, tauntauns uh, that they ride. Yeah, you know, if you if you have if you see them in motion riding a tauntaun, they shot that with a little tauntaun and like a little dude yeah, just put on top of that. And, and then they had trap doors. There was it was a painting background and then, you know, the actual like stage, right, is a platform with like a bunch of baking soda on it. And then they had little trap doors and they'd come up and they'd move the thing and then go back down, they get the shot and yeah, come back up and, and just yeah, still so, frame it. I, I I think that shit's really cool. Like you know the death the Death Star was like four feet. Yeah, you know, and so that that's and cool still thing. I mean you know at least from us seeing the end product they still were able to squeeze a lot of detail into that and yeah. uh, obviously got some pretty amazing shots out of it. So yeah, it's really cool. So I I've definitely grown to appreciate the special features much much more as we've started the Star Wars yeah. series. So number three, um, oh, and I had another spiel about why I chose airplane. Apparently, <laughs> uh, continue appa- rant. Apparently, I just I went on with my own rant, and I said the simplest, simplest humor you can get: light plot line to move things along, get you to the next joke. So I chose airplane. I was close to putting either Bill Burr, or Paper Tiger. I'm sorry you feel that way. Or Louis C.K. live at the Comedy Store, or Dave Chappelle live at Austin City Limits, or Norm Macdonald Hitler's dog gossip and trickery, but because I love stand up, but I figured let's just go uh, airplane. Sure. So anyhow, number three, I want to put my favorite mob movie on here. So I went with Goodfellas. Just an awesome mob story. I love mob shit. I love Sopranos. Oh, you know, just. We do mob march on this podcast. Like, this is not a mystery if you're <laughs> any kind of regular listener here. Uh, and if you're new here, go back to our only audio uh, podcasts from March this year. Legend, Goodfellas, uh, Killing Them Softly, and what the fuck else did we do? It doesn't matter right this moment, but... Quality content back from then, and... Hopefully, yeah. Uh, just love mob stuff, so... Anyway, you're number three. Sure. Uh, so that's that's where I started moving to the uh, kind of like my needed to have a comedy on the list. Um, so I went with White Chicks. Uh, that's fun. Yeah. yeah. So White Chicks is one of those movies that I just, I, I would watch it all the time. Uh, like during the summer, like I'm not doing much as a kid. Like I just plop the DVD in and let it run. And I, I've, I'm, I'm sure I've watched that movie, you know, a hundred times. Um, but that's, that's one I always try and get people to watch because I always enjoy it more getting somebody new to watch that movie. And it's always so much funnier to me when I get to share that. When they're laughing so hard for the first time. Yeah, it's like, it, it, it makes me feel so good. Like, just the, the, the overall premise of it is beyond ridiculous. You know, you, you get these, like, two black dudes who are going to dress up as, like, these prissy white girls, invade this party and, you know, do some rec- reconnaissance work or whatever. And then... You know, they're just like, oh no, I've I've gotten mixed up with like all their girlfriends, so now we're just gonna like hang out and like try and make it work, and then like they they're uncovering everything. Like it's this just, dude's trying to fuck me. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> and you know, make my way down to like it's 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 so. Terry Crews on drugs, dancing with the glow stick. God, Terry Crews really does like help make a lot of these scenes. If, if they went with anyone else besides Terry Crews as just like that character to. Uh, you kind of roll around, take the one guy out, uh, you know, get on drugs and start dancing. Uh, he's he's so perfect. And then they wake up with, uh, I forget what the other guy's name is, but he wakes up in the bed together with the other guy by yeah. the end of that night. And then they do like the whole generic, like, ah, you know, yeah. the scream once they realize what they've done. Like, it's so fun that it goes from like their regular, like Wayne the Brother comedy to, uh, I guess, kind of like the almost like really generic kind of stuff where it's like, 
You know, it's like, oh no, like they're screaming together in unison or whatever, or they do the scene later with the two Olsen twins and like, oh no, yeah. we've been cloned! And they like stare at the camera and everything. Like, there's just so much novelty involved in that, and I'd, I'd oh, yeah. watch White Chicks. I'd watch <laughs> Lord of the Rings and then White Chicks finish off with Pulp Fiction. There you go. It'd be a great day. Once you go black, you will need, need a wheelchair. wheelchair. So many quotes from that, too, that I'll, I'll use and probably nobody gets. But that's fine. <laughs> uh, number four. A movie I always find myself wanting to watch. Um, like, Do you have a movie like this where there's two of these that always come up in my head? Is I just get the random craving for Reservoir Dogs. Which, and the random craving for Inglorious Bastards, which I realized that would, I, I figured I couldn't just put like three Tarantino movies on here. That'd be a little ridiculous. A little bit of favoritism. But yeah. I did go with two. Um, I decided uh, between Reservoir Dogs and Inglorious Bastards on Inglorious Bastards, uh, no matter how many times I watch either of those two movies, uh, Dogs or Bastards is. I never get fucking sick of them. Uh, I decided on Inglorious Bastards because two of the three on my list here so far, like, they had something to do with gangsters or, you know, something yeah. to that effect. So I was like, well, let's go with, like, a war thing. And who doesn't love a movie where the end is, like, Hitler gets shot excessively? Yeah. So. No, that's a fair point. Yeah. Inglorious Bastards is pretty sick, so. Yeah. So. Cool. Uh, moving into my my next one here, uh, this kind of helped cement me actually recently seeing the new Jurassic World movie. Yeah. Uh, but Jurassic Park is a movie that is like very near and dear to my heart. Um, uh, yeah, as a kid, I was just really into dinosaurs. I watched a lot of like the documentaries and stuff, and then seeing Jurassic Park, like that was the world that I hoped we would get one day. Is that somewhere on an island somewhere that we had like dinosaurs just like chilling and causing mayhem. Um. So, I mean, the, the series as as a whole gets to be a little ridiculous because it's like, how do we mess up this many times, yeah. you know, as far as trying to have dinosaurs and, you know, fuck that whole thing up. Um, but Jurassic Park 1 just, just always really did it for me. The the practical effects involved uh, in, in hand with, like, some of the actual, like, CGI effects that they went with afterwards was really amazing. They actually had a big-ass T-Rex. You know, like, people had to man it. There was a dude in the Velociraptor suit. Um, that's one of the other ones where it's like the special features really lend so much and kind of going back and doing some research on it. Uh, it's, it's just so interesting to me. Um, and yeah, that's, that's the type of thing where it's like, there just weren't a whole lot of movies that like were able to do such a good combination of like practical effects, the CGI effects and have some badass looking dinosaurs and everything still felt like kind of scary or like really like, uh, intimidating. You know, when they have the Velociraptor in the kitchen, yeah. like hunting the kids or whatever, and you see, like, the nail come down and click in, like, it's just, it gives you chills still, because yeah. it was just so well done that even despite how far technology has gone, that still looks cool as shit, and it gives you the feeling that they were going for every single time. Um, so, yeah, so big, big love for Jurassic Park. For sure. Um, so, number five... <laughs> So this got really hard. <laughs> Did I want something else funny? I love a comedy special. Uh, I'd figure I'd get more comedy with Chappelle's show when we get to TV shows, so I decided not to. I almost talked myself into The Godfather, but it seemed excessive with all the gangsters stuff on this list. And I decided I would miss Star Wars, so I put my favorite episode of Star Wars on here, which is episode 5. Which... Star Wars is just fun. It's fantasy land. Yeah. And you can't go wrong with Star Wars. You really can't. And uh, it's a good it's a good human story and like everything's everything's in flux in five and just a lot going on and that's why it is my favorite, just because you just I, I think it's prime Star Wars, you yeah. know? It's already started up, so you already got intros to everything. Yeah, you already got a little bit of end. the context. It's not about to end, like in six, right? And so you just write in it, and I love it. So, yeah, that's pretty much my explanation. I'm with you. Yeah. So finishing up my list, uh, I, I too was kind of thinking like how I wanted to finish this up. You know, like should I do like a comedy or something? I decided to go with a little bit more of like a drama. 
because um, this is one I, that I always found like really uh, interesting, and I always felt a certain kind of way after watching it. Um, yeah. But Pursuit of Happiness with Will Smith. Have yeah. you ever seen that? Mm-hmm. Okay. A long um, time ago, but yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, I was thinking about that. I was kind of going through like a lot of the movies I really liked, and uh, th- this one just kind of kept coming up for me. Um, but I just really love the way uh, kind of that the story is told in a way where it's like, uh, you know, Will Smith's character isn't always, like, making the right decision every single time. Like, he isn't always, like, the best dad or, like, the best partner or anything like that. But, like, he's still just trying so desperately hard to make things work. And the, the whole movie is really just, like, a, a constant struggle of him just trying to make things work. And I think that just makes it a really relatable story because there are a lot of people in those same kind of, same kind of position where it's like, hey, like I'm just, I'm just trying to make a little bit of money. Like I'm just trying to take care of my kids. I'm just trying to like keep, keep the four walls around me upright, mm-hmm. keep the roof over my head, um, and and it only works sometimes. And I just, I love kind of the the realistic aspect that it wasn't just like a start to finish, like things just worked out for them, you know. And he just constantly was doing better. Um, you know, shit was kind of up and down the whole time. And I would say my favorite part is just that it more so ends with him getting, like, this this internship or, like, this position, finally, and that's that's more so how we roll credits on rather than, like, a we've seen how their life turned out because I think that's, that's a lot more realistic of how life actually happens is that sometimes just, just the one thing comes into play and now it's, it's figuring out how we do everything else after that and I, I really like the way that that's how we ended the story was just him walking down the street, like after he kind of got the information that he was going to get this position and he's just like walking, he's like having a good time or whatever. And then I, I think he just like starts cheering or like clapping to himself. And I just, I always thought it was just like this really kind of interesting scene where it's just like, all right, like this is something, this is something that I can at least take the next step on. Mm-hmm. Um, and to me, that just made it like a really personable story, like a really realistic story. Because uh, sometimes that's all people get is just that that one thing that happens to work out, and then you know they're pretty much going through that whole movie again with their next slew of struggles, next slew of trying to figure things out. Um, yeah. So that's that's one I could watch a lot because I just just kind of seeing his struggle, seeing his perseverance, and uh, kind of just having that like a you know we're on to the next small baby step of of life. Uh, just really does it for me. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. So, TV shows. Um, shows would be much quicker as far as my explanations. Sure. Um, for me, um, after watching Sopranos, it's I don't know if it's like my 100% favorite show, but it's right up there with, say, a Breaking Bad... Um, an office, that kind of thing, as sure. far as my f- personal favorites. Uh, and as I've established on this pod and many others, I love mob stuff. Mob shit. So uh, I threw Sopranos as my first show. Just good time. It's got some comedy built in there. And uh, just just good time. A lot of great stories in it. So, yeah. So, uh, I didn't take a lot of time thinking this, the f- at least as far as my number one spot, because this just immediately came to me, uh, but X-Files. Okay. Uh, I love the shit out of X-Files. I love, like, the Monster of the Week kind of format, and then just kind of, like, the overarching story kind of carrying them through. Um, I love seeing the two characters interact with each other. I love that it wasn't, like, just a really obvious love interest that was keeping a male and a female lead just like in really close proximity of each other that there was just like true friendship and caring um but yeah like x-files is just so cool like there and, and that kind of goes into some like the practical effects and cgi effects too maybe that's the thing that really does it for me is just a really good use of those those things in a show or a movie um but yeah they did some wild things in that show it was really interesting they had jack black in an episode that was cool <laughs> but uh it's just something that like it's it's so interesting and a lot of the episodes are like different enough from each other that like some episodes are almost like a little bit more of a comedy some of them are a lot more serious some of them are a lot more like action focused um but it, i just feel like it checks a lot of different boxes throughout the series uh to keep me interested in it yeah um 
I, I didn't really get into the like reboot series quite as much, um, but like the the initial set, and then when they did like the the movie and everything, um, all of that uh, really does it for me. X Files is cool shit for me. <laughs> also, aliens. Well, there you go. And that opening thing. <laughs> yeah, I'll check out some X Files. Don't say it. <laughs> you haven't seen. Sorry, it's only why we're here, right? Uh, I just want Chappelle show number two. Mm. In my opinion, the best sketch show ever. It's very funny. I love comedy. I love Dave Chappelle. That's kind it. of my whole explanation. So, Fair enough. Yeah. All right. Uh, so next up, I had a uh, Dragon Ball Z. Okay. So uh, I, I was debating whether or not I really needed to have like an animated show on this, and then I decided I've spent enough uh, percentage of my life watching. Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Z, and all the other series that it felt right to have Dragon Ball Z on there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, You know, watched it on Cartoon Network and everything growing up. Uh, Going back and and watching through, it's it's maybe a little bit grating and a lot of filler sometimes. Going back and watching some of the abridged versions of it is another way to re-experience the show. A bunch of random people just re-dubbed the whole thing and turned it into like a little bit more of a comedy. Interesting. Which is an excellent way to go back after you've watched the whole show, because they just cut out all the bullshit, and it's kind of just a really hot and fast take of the whole show while they're all kind of talking shit about each other. Nice. Um, but yeah, Dragon Ball Z was like just one of those shows that was almost a daily driver for me growing up, and uh, you know I'll still go back and watch uh, some like uh, the really good episodes of Dragon Ball Z, and uh, it's it's just like I'm a kid again, even if they're sitting there just yelling at each other for 15 minutes. Or, you know, we're waiting 23 episodes for Frieza to blow up a planet. Like, it just it just hits so right. Yeah. And uh, it's it's just one of those shows that still lets me go back and feel like a kid for a hot minute. I remember I was not allowed to not watch allowed. Dragon Ball Z. Uh, my mom told me I wasn't allowed to watch that or, or Samurai Jack. Samurai? Oh, whoa. What could both be wrong with Samurai Jack and Dragon Ball Z? Listen, just the violence I involved? I don't know, but... I remember it being really funny because then my brother comes into the world. And, you know, it's I don't I think it's just a parent thing where I think the second go around, the second time you have a kid, it's just kind of like you're a little more lax. Yeah. So whereas when I was five, I couldn't watch Dragon Ball Z or Samurai Jack. My brother uh, murdered people on Grand Theft Auto yeah. when he was five. So. <laughs> Some people get different upbringings, even in the same house. Even in the same household, yeah, yeah. That's rough. Uh, it's it just it's a funny thing more than anything. You know, I I'm, I don't like look back at my childhood going, man, I wish I watched Dragon Ball Z. I just more look at that being really funny. Yeah, where it's like, um, oh, I, I wasn't allowed to watch Dragon Ball Z, but yeah, it's, it'd be really funny if she like reinforced it on like like Luke still like. He's murdering people in Grand Theft Auto. And he's like, I'm going to go watch Dragon Ball Z. Like, no! <laughs> no. You get back on GTA and shoot those innocent people. Um, number four, I said Breaking Bad. Uh, again, one of my top shows. Um, it's just fantastic. The stakes are always high. At first, Walt starts out as a good guy. And then by practically by the end of the show, he's... He's the bad guy. Yeah. And it's a very interesting role reversal. And the fact that they pretty much trick you into rooting for the villain. And you don't really even know it until you look back at the show in hindsight and just go like, wait, 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 wait. Like, that's... He's doing bad things now. That's... Yeah. You know, it's this is no longer for his family and stuff like that. And But that's always been such a good storytelling element is where it's like they they flip the script on like what the character represents, but like the viewer is still blindly invested in them. And then, yeah, by the time you get to the the end, it's like, like, am I wrong? Like, have have I been invested in the wrong guy? Like, is is, is this bad? Yeah. So that, yeah, I like, I like that show a lot. It's wildly entertaining and stakes are always very high. Yeah. So good pick. Uh, so, next one for me was The Twilight Zone. Okay. Um, so this also, I guess, goes a little bit into, like, some of the Monster of the Week kind of stuff, but also, like, it's, it's such an old series, and, in being able to see, like, how they develop, like, different, I guess, storytelling elements, you know, all the way back from, like, when they did the first run of it, 
And, uh, you know, I mean, that, that shows been a thing for, for years. Um, so number one, so many episodes, Yeah, you know, you, if I'm on a deserted Island and I don't have to watch the same episode twice for, you know, a couple of years, yeah. that'd be neat. Um, but that was one of the other ones too. Like I said, just, just with it being like a, a, a monster of the week or like a story of the week kind of thing, there are all these sort of self-contained stories, even though in these, there's not much to kind of carry each episode from one to another. Mm-hmm. Um, they still did a really good way of telling like these really short and sweet stories. Um, definitely kind of more so in the later ones than the early ones. The early episodes were a little bit more of just a, uh, this thing is happening. Now this thing is happening. Now this bad thing has happened. Roll credits. Yeah. Um, so they did a little bit better of it once they got through. Um, but yeah, Twilight Zone is, uh, is pretty lit. Go back and watch Twilight Zone. All, like, eight billion seasons of it. I skipped my number three. I just realized I said number four first. Um... Number my number three, which whatever it's my number four. Whatever. The next one, The Office, is a great comedy. There's a lot of human elements to it, and there's nine seasons of it. Which again, as you just said, if I'm on an island, or it's the only thing I can watch, or whatever this case may be, <laughs> that whatever this odd scenario, this is, very vague scenario, this vague scenario, whatever the parameters, if I'm only allowed to watch these ten things then The Office with nine seasons is a good one. Sure. And The Sopranos with their six seasons is great. And yep. The Chappelle Show and, you know, Breaking Bad's five seasons. So, yeah. Pretty long run. Good stuff. Yeah. yeah. So The Office. Yeah. So I uh, I went as far as, like, my sitcom. I was really kind of debating. Um, the Office, I, I was a really big fan of. Uh, Friends, pretty big fan of. Um, but How I Met Your Mother, for whatever reason, just... just decided to take the throne for me as far as like my sitcom show um i really like uh just how bad everything works out for ted yeah. all the time um because sometimes i feel like that's you know we're all ted sometimes yeah. you know it's just like you feel like you're doing everything right like you're 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 in the right and it's everyone else that's wrong uh and you still lose yeah and uh, i felt like that just happened to ted all the time um and it was kind of like a nice perseverance out of him uh, i really love uh neil patrick harris's character yeah uh, he's just so fun. He's so bad. Like, he's such a bad person. Yeah. But uh, he still did a lot of things that was, like, very, like, caring for his friends or whatnot. And even things that they, like, probably didn't even see. Like, I'm thinking of the one scene where it's, like, uh, like Marshall was crying because him and uh, the homegirl had broken up. And then, uh, like, he, like, just sat down and was talking to him. Marshall was sad. And he's like, all right. And he gets up and he, like, flies out and goes to her. And talks to her, and it's like, hey, listen, like, you guys need to get back together. He's really upset about it. Like, it goes through the whole spiel, and he's like, don't tell anybody this ever happened. And then he just went home. Yeah. And it's like, that's that's such a bad shit interaction. But, like, they, they kind of set up characters to be kind of bad shit in those different ways that, like, it still makes sense, even though no one would ever do that. One of my favorite things Barney does is uh, his little hangover remedy. It's just, like, this random mixture of all these nasty things. Yeah. And it's like, oh, yeah, it's the hangover cure. And, like, really, it was just kind of a placebo thing. Like, he made him think that it was this yeah. grand thing. I mean, that's, that's like, really, really how I most... I just wanted you guys to think you were feeling good. <laughs> yeah. And it worked. And it worked, and it was a thing he did for them. So, a lot of, uh, you know, caring, but without seeming like he's caring kind of thing was nice yeah. out of his character. But, you know, I would say, honestly, my, my biggest thing out of that show is just Ted getting dunked on, like, pretty constantly and things not working out for him. Him just continuing to try, yeah. Because again, maybe that goes back to like pursuit of happiness, just just that level of like perseverance and some of that realism. With maybe just it doesn't have a good reason for why things don't work out. They just don't work out, and you just got to keep moving. Yeah. Um, so maybe some parallels between those two, but that's that was the sitcom I decided to go with. Did you like? I I had enormous problems with the last season. Okay. Of, well, of just how that show ended. Yeah. Because they go through this whole... And now, and again, maybe, you know, it's it has a little bit to do with the realism of everything as we're talking about. But the way that the show ends on, like, Robin and Barney are, <laughs> spoilers, uh, <laughs> divorced, right? And then Ted just ends up going after Robin again. Whereas you made this whole show about Ted finding these kids' mother 
and like this perfect woman for him. Mm-hmm. And then in the end, he just kind of like goes back to Robin. And the fact that the most of the entire last season was what's her hot conference? Rocker attack. Yeah, apparently. Um, it's the rescue copter. We're being saved. <laughs> We're being saved. Yes. The desert island. <laughs> we don't have to watch only these things. Throw this fucking list away. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, the fact that the majority of that season takes place at the destination that is Robin and Barney's wedding. Yeah. And then they just, like, divorce after what? Was it, like, did they say, like, Four year, I don't remember the number. Yeah, it was a pretty insignificant married, amount of time. Very yeah. short marriage. And, I don't know, just to devote that much of the show to it, I don't know, man. Now, also, though, there is some realism to that because, you know, how many of your friends from, you know, whatever age that you're at are you always going to be friends with? Like, how many friend groups have you had that have yeah. kind of just trailed off? Like, a, you know, that, that all makes sense. Um, just frustrating as a viewer. It's just a less satisfying answer, yeah, for all yeah. of this to go through, and then it just to be like, well, turns out that did matter. This is just a lot of years of frustration, and for not. Yeah, and the way the kids were just like, "Why don't you go bang our aunt?" Was yeah, like what they said, because <laughs> like, like she, and now she's not like technically. Their aunt or whatever, yeah, but, but like that's what they. Your you know, close friends, we've you all kinda, had yeah. those those characters in our lives. Oh, that's Uncle Whatever, and it's like he's not really your uncle. It's just that's what we call him. Sure, yeah. My mom's always like, "Yeah, this is Uncle Bob," and then they go away for six hours. <laughs> yeah, I'm just kidding, mom. <laughs> uh, that reminds me of that always the and always sunny was like. Very close to being on this list. Yeah, same. It's just, I wanted some of the serious shows, like Sopranos and Breaking Bad. Even looking at it now, I might replace Always Sunny with Office. God, I don't know, man. It's so fucking close. Well, okay, here's why I didn't. Because my number five, uh, moving ahead... You just touched it. Okay. It's <laughs> like, oh no. <laughs> Made a horrible error. Uh, number five for me is Curb. Uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm. For anyone who doesn't know <laughs> the rest of that. Um, because I love Seinfeld. And Curb is basically R-rated Seinfeld. Okay. Like, the same, one of the, one of the same minds involved. Larry David was always... He was like the other guy with Seinfeld, just writing wise. It wasn't, he wasn't in the show much except for the beginning. He actually did like the voice of Newman because you never really saw Newman at yeah. first in Seinfeld. Like he was the one that was like yelling on the roof. And if you remember, there's an episode early where Jerry wakes up because uh, he has like a comedy idea and he's writing it down. And there's something on the TV. And Larry David's actually whoever the guy is on the TV going like yes yes <laughs> like it's all so uh, Larry and not that that was relevant to the conversation at all really but Curb there's a, again a lot of it and that's the other thing with Seinfeld is there's a lot of it but I leaned Curb because there's just I feel like there's so much more freedom with Curb being an HBO show and. There's just a lot more raunchy stuff. And Seinfeld's in some of the stuff. Yeah. And so you kind of get the best of those worlds there. I feel like you're still kind of getting Seinfeld. And I'm figuring if I'm going to the island or whatever the fuck, I'm, I'm going to do Curb. And you know what? I'm changing out office for Always Sunny, and that's final. Bold so move. You're at number five. Yeah. So yeah, I, I you know always sunny was definitely up there with me. Uh, I, I decided not to let it be on this list. Um, what I felt like I wanted was like a good, I guess uh, something more in like the Law and Order CSI uh, spectrum. So I went with Law and Order SVU. Um, okay. Mershka Hargitay is is Bay. She's the the female lead. Okay. Um, so I, I decided that was the way to go. Um, and and partially just because of the duration. Obviously, we got a bunch of seasons there. Um, but I just, 
just kind of like those, I guess, almost generic kind of crime shows. There was something that was so easy to pick up and watch. Um, and it was, it was just always fun. Like, there there were very few episodes that I would ever watch that show, and I'd be like, oh, well, that was dumb. Like, it was just always interesting enough that, like, if an episode was on, I would just watch it out. Um, so that, that, that finished up for me. I could always watch some SVU. Yeah. Alright. So what were... I don't know, what are some... Some lines you can draw of similarities uh, across your five shows. Uh, well, I'd say it might be like some of the like the you know the real people stories or like the the humanism and some of it there. So like if we go yeah. through like uh, like pursuit of happiness, you know maybe some of the things out of like how I met your mother. Um, you know some things out of that I think just draw and make really good storytelling in general. You know if it's something realistic, relatable, that's an easy way to you know kind of tell your story and get people invested in your characters get them to kind of see it out because you always hope things work out for the best yeah and uh it's almost better storytelling when things don't work out for the best Mm -hmm. because that seems like that's the the more realistic outcome and that may be a little negative to think that way but uh pessimistic but yeah you know i mean i've never really been a fan of one i mean obviously you like it sometimes when things end happily yeah ever after the cliche right but a lot of times it just seems so i mean obviously cliche but it doesn't quite like capture it just kind of like oh yeah well duh of course of course it works out well Yeah. yeah of course they figured that out yeah of course the cancer's gone or you know i don't know <laughs> that seems extreme but you know what i mean just I don't know. Sometimes it just feels like I, I. I'm also like a really big cunt sometimes, you know. But as long as you're the one saying it, not me. It's sometimes just you know from the realism fact of just kind of like, yeah, but that's not how things go. Sometimes I don't know. And like I said, it's it's in some ways it's almost like more fun or more interesting or just a better story all overall. Like when shit doesn't work out. Yeah. Um. For instance, for me, on my list, Breaking Bad, I mean, <laughs> spoilers, you know, Walt's dead in the end, and they kind of left you with that inkling of like, ooh, maybe Walt's alive, then they show El Camino, and he gets on, he's, like, the Jesse gets back to, uh, I can't remember their names, but... <laughs> Skinny Pete and uh, I almost want to say Ratchet. Maybe it's a rabbit. Something with an R. Uh, but he gets back to their place and, you know, on the news is like, you know, dude's dead. And so then you're like, oh, so. Guess that's it. Yeah, I guess that's it for him. Because I, I, I don't know. There's a lot of ways I thought that after movie could go. Like Walt's like sitting in jail, just like steaming. Yeah. You know, and he figures some shit out, and but set um, up some sequel material, maybe or yeah, something. Which, but but then wouldn't be realistic, and so yeah. well, I like it as much. Um, the human struggles of it, you know, Soprano is kind of the same way. I would say shit doesn't really work out. Um, depends on your take on the diner scene, the final diner scene. Uh, everybody's got their own opinion on that one. Catch Black. Yeah. I think he's dead. Personally. It's a mob story. People get whacked. It's kind of why we're here. They were talking about... Uh, you know, a couple episodes later. A lot of people have the misconception when I've read stuff online. People say... Uh, people say it just goes... That they said it just goes black. Which that was actually never said uh they did say like you know that's i had the whole thing written out at one point and then we I was in gonna, defense of the soprano uh just my point sure. of view and like my like reading of the actual like just like listening to the scene like four times and then like even turn on subtitles and be like okay so they said this because like, a lot of people said like oh it just goes black and I'm like well that's not what they said yeah. they said a whole different thing but, but again, things. However, you interpret that show ending, 
But I would say most of the dudes in their crew die. I don't think anybody wanted Christopher Maltesanti to be dead or for Tony Soprano to kill him with that. You know, major spoilers here. Um, so, you know, that, that's definitely a common line. Hard, you know, the, the, the character is always having some kind of struggle to go through. Yeah. Right? People love a good struggle. Yeah, otherwise, I mean, if everything's just fucking sunshine and rainbows. Yeah. Well, yeah who's who's going to watch a TV show, show about a guy who just wakes up and his day only gets better? Yeah. Like, there's no there's no development there. Who cares? <laughs> who gives a shit? That's called porn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just Somebody order up. a pizza! <laughs> yeah. That guy just wakes up and gets his dick sucked all the time. That's just called porn. Yeah. Um, and then I kind of fuck it up by putting the comedy shows in there. But I like to laugh. And I guess that's the line I could draw with those shows. Yeah. Between uh, Curb and Always Sunny. Always Sunny is so show. good, though. Like, I, I could definitely see why you were <laughs> trying to contend between that and The Office. Yeah, it was, it was really hard. And the fact that I have now changed it during the episode is funny. But, yeah. yeah. Uh, what's a line I can draw with my movies? I love gangster stuff. The endings aren't all necessarily happy. Pulp Fiction's not a happy ending, if you think about it. I mean, you know, they resolved the thing in the diner, but that's not really the order yeah. of operations. He so, still gets murked in yeah, Vince, a bathroom, so... Yeah, yeah Vince, yeah, he Vince still is gets... gonna get murdered. Jules, who knows? Yeah. Well, yeah, um, Jules was setting up to call it quits, you know, he's like, listen, like, I've had, I've had my close call, like, I've recognized that, like, I'm, I'm calling it quits. And then that's almost kind of, I don't know, irony or, you know, should have knocked on wood when you said that or whatever, but like, you know, Vince just calling him ridiculous and giving him a bunch of shit for it, then of course Vince goes and, yeah. you know, Butch gets him. But I mean, yeah. and and that's one of the things where like it could have been the absolute reverse, you know, if it was uh, uh, Vincent that had decided like, all right, like that's enough, that was a close call for me, like that probably would have been Jules in there instead. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then he would have gotten murdered. So it was just the, uh, uh, you have people on like different sides or in different places with their lives. They witness the same event and then they interpret two completely separate things out of it, and then immediate repercussions for, you know, what they decide to do with that information. Jules was like, all right, I'm going to call it quits. You know, we can assume he's maybe, you know, fucking about and having a good life. And then yeah. Vincent just gets straight up murked or with all been, the disrespect in the world. Or he's been walking the earth, as he says. Yeah. And then he... Uh, like a bum. <laughs> like a bum, as Vince says. And, uh, you know, maybe he pops up in, you know, Quentin Tarantino's 10th movie. You know, World and he's, know, he's helping uh, Virginia Green's daughter. Yeah, so maybe uh, I'm blanking on this because I know one of the other movies. Um, it's like Vincent's brother or cousin is in that. It's in Reservoir Dogs. Yeah, yeah, it was Reservoir Dogs. Okay, so I knew it was one of the movies that um, they at least had Vic that. Vega. Yeah, mild connection there. Yeah, and that was after the events of Pulp Fiction, right? Reservoir Dogs was the first. Reservoir Dogs was the first? Really? Yeah. Because I thought they referenced something to Vincent getting murdered, but maybe not. No. Uh, there was a scene that was cut out of Pulp Fiction uh, where there, I, I think there was a Vic thing and then Michael Madsen couldn't do it or something. It's been a while since I looked that whole thing up. So okay. That's a little fuzzy, but there's something, something going on there where... Vic, I think, was supposed to be involved with Vince in the movie and his whole thing. And for whatever reason, I think it got cut out. I, I don't remember exactly the details. Don't quote me on any of that. True. Sure. But something happened. Maybe we'll look it up later. Yeah. Feel uh, free to do your research at home and Yell at us. email me at consequencehotline.com. What a dipshit I am. Um, obviously, I like crime stuff. Now, why do I like crime stuff? Why is crime stuff... A popular thing. Everybody seems to like crime, mm -hmm. right? I mean, not necessarily all mob, but, you know, as popular as things like Law and Order SVU are, you know, how many fucking CSI, NCIS shows <laughs> yeah. are there? Um, 
I guess, what's the deal with crime? Crime what's, is cool. What's the deal with crime? So it's it's both being able to see like the the bad side of crime and kind of like the aftermath of it, but then getting the the reconciliation of somebody having to deal with the aftermath of it. You know, pursue the person, and then we usually get you know the nice clean ending by the end of the episode. Yeah. So some of that does come from like the and man, maybe that's kind of the opposite side of like we like it when things don't work out, but with crime shows like. It almost seems like the the just desserts usually does come in whatever form that may be. So it's like it's still a satisfying resolution, even if, you know, most of it ends with somebody getting murked or, you know, getting locked up or... It's a revenge aspect. Maybe. It's resolving. Because in a way, yes, it does all work out in the end, but... For who? (laughs) Yes, because whoever was in the beginning of the show, whoever's body we're looking over, it didn't work out for them. On account of the dead body. On account of the dead body, and we're trying to figure out why it didn't work out. And I guess, if you will, kind of almost trying to get that revenge at that point. Maybe that's the line with the crime show. Yeah, it's it's, it's almost revenge or, you know, just waiting for the... The come gettins or whatever. Yeah. It's come gettins the word. There's some kind of phrase like that. I don't know. Something. Pulp Fiction's not a happy ending. Airplane's a happy ending, but it's ridiculous and it's comedy. <laughs> yeah. So that's or, that's my line with that. If it's ridiculous, is it funny? Then I like it. Sure. Uh, Lord of the Rings Return of the King is a happy ending. Spoiler. But with much suffering. Yeah. And it didn't work out for some people. Right? A lot of people. That's okay. Most of them were unnamed. There you go. <laughs> well, he lost a handful of named characters. Uh, Glory's Bastards is history corrected to be a happy ending. Yeah. Which is honestly, which I know the camera doesn't catch it, but Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is that. It's based on the Manson murders, and, you know, what if they went into the wrong house yeah. that night? what if we shuffled kind of things deal. up a bit? You know, <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, I don't want to say fifth. Yeah, yeah, Star Wars. Human story. And that one doesn't work out for me. Now, in six, it works out. Yeah. With a lot of human sacrifice, but, um... Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, finished up with my past couple, or last couple. Uh, Jurassic Park, you know, finishes up. We get the happy ending for, you know, the people who uh, weren't, weren't knew weren't that dinosaur. this was a bad idea to begin with. Yeah. And then uh, that T-Rex, you know, it, he, he's wrecking shit. So, I mean, things worked out pretty well for him, but... Uh, now, does he... I, I, I recall that in the, the later ones... The, the Rex always seems to be the hero. Yeah, the T-Rex is absolutely a superhero. I want to say in in 3, the T-Rex gets murked by, like, a Spinosaurus. This is when they're on uh, one of the other islands and, like, the, the plane, like, crash lands. But I'm pretty sure the T-Rex gets murked in that one by a Spinosaurus. But in pretty much all the other ones, the T-Rex is, like, OP and just wrecks everything else. Which, uh... It, it's probably just more so a novelty of the T-Rex being almost like a, a good guy character from the first one. Overpowered OP. Yeah. In case you didn't know. Um, it's taken you, like, <laughs> it's taken me, like, a bunch of times hearing you say that for me to really get Cement in, brain. in your brain. So maybe, maybe when you say OP, yeah. like, there should just be a little thing. Overpowered. You that yeah, we, like we can have cliff notes put in. Um... But yeah, no, I, I, I kind of like the novelty of, like, the T-Rex almost being, like, a a protagonist and, you know, a good guy character throughout the series, because, yeah. you know, grand scheme of things, at least towards our main character, he doesn't do a ton of harm. <laughs> he yeah. eats a couple of them. Yeah. But uh, it, it works out. Hmm. Yeah, so then how do we apply that when we go through... And say what the most watched movies are. What, what do we take away from this? That kind of the movies aren't supposed to work out, or they work out in some way, but maybe not all the way. Yeah, the resolution isn't always for who our main character is, but it's for somebody. Yeah. 
just desserts is kind of a a thing that comes up, you know. People get what's coming to them, whether good or bad. Mm-hmm. Good chunk of human story, realism, human elements, you know. Yeah. And people like love. People like love. Loves a, loves a thing. Honey, but... I fucked that up. That Tarantino thing. The third thing was the... The robbery thing. Robbery was the other movie trope that he was attacking. Oh, okay, okay. It just just clicked. Anyway. <laughs> There's someone screaming. Going, that's not it! Well, no. if, if you waited this long, you're welcome and sorry. Congratulations! And my apologies. Um... Yeah, so we'll use those criteria as we do the next one. We'll write criteria down. We have human story doesn't necessarily work out. And it's almost preferable to not work out. (laughs) Almost preferable. And, uh... Yeah. yeah, I think it's kind of interesting. None of ours really have much in the way of, like... I mean, what does that say about us? Because, like, it's someone else's list, like, just a bunch of happy ending movies? Well, you know, and they might be, but, like, I was thinking, too, like, there's not much in the way of, like, twist endings or anything that was just, like, crazy out of left field. Yeah. Um. But, yeah. I mean, that's that's fine. I, I'm aware that I'm not the biggest fan of just things wrapping up in a nice bow yes. kind of thing. I know what I'm about. Yeah, me either. Um... So, and that's fine, because this is a biased podcast for biased people. Get with our views or get out. No. <laughs> Alright, well. But I say, as, as we kind of go through these, we can kind of draw, like, some of the parallels with, like, well, you know, we enjoy these for the different ways, and if we kind of deconstruct some of the elements of the movies, we can see how that trails back to some of our must-watches and... You know, kind of helps reinforce why we feel that way about some of these things. More or less, this will be a list of, I guess, what we can agree on is must watch. And then, you know, kind of discounting what the rest of the world yeah, <laughs> uh, thinks about it. But we will say, hey, you know what the must watch movies are? These. And it will be 100% biased. And we'll see what it is. And so... Uh, we took a break from the decade thing this week. Uh, we'll probably do highest grossing 70s maybe next week. Or maybe we should try to... Maybe we shouldn't... Maybe we should take a couple... A uh, couple weeks to... Give it some room uh, to really breathe dive and watch. into the 60s stuff. Yeah. Yeah, because that was a little bit more of an overview. And, uh, I mean, we did get a decent list of what we were thinking were must-watch based off of just what we had known and kind of gathered from that podcast, so... If we so could then, kind of dive into it and maybe see what the result of that was and if we still agree with maybe what should have been a must-watch or what we could have lived without. Yeah. Something to that effect, yeah. Sure. And then we'll do the same thing in the 70s and do a second one there, 80s, 90s, and all that shit. So. Cool. Yeah, this was the five movies and shows about islands. Or, no, not, yeah, anyway... Uh, <laughs> thanks for listening. We're Content Crisis Hotline at Yahoo.com to uh, critique us and uh, at Content Crisis 1 on Twitter. So, thanks for listening, and uh, we'll be back next time. Goodbye. <laughs>